today's message is falling away. Uh, you can come up with all kinds of thoughts about falling away. At least I can. Uh, when you think about different things that have occurred in your life and different people that have come in and out of your life, and you think about the ones that have fallen away in your life, uh, you start. Some will start coming to mind right now. I know you can start picking up on a few that have kind of come and gone. Even here at Impact Church, there's been some falling away. I mean, people come in, and then before we know it, they're falling away. And we go, well, what's up with that? I mean, I don't understand, but it's life. It's part of it. There's always a constant falling away. I remember there's always uh, that couple that you've known for years and years, and you, you thought they were a great couple, you know, they're just fantastic, and you're always amazed at how much they show their love for each other and care for each other, and then all of a sudden you find out at some point that they've fallen, fallen away from each other, and off they go in their own separate ways. I mean, I've known folks that had families, had children, small children, and just, and one of them just leave. That's a complete falling away. Just leave and, and go somewhere else in the country or go far away where really there's no connection to family anymore. So it just destroys, busts up the family. I'm falling away and all of the destruction that's associated with falling away. It's, it's, it's massive. It's, it's hard to even measure fully the destruction of them falling away. And there's falling away going on all the time. People are falling away all the time. And Scripture begins to talk about falling away. It begins to teaching us what is it, what does it mean. When you see falling away in Scripture, a lot of the time it's talking about the people that renounce their faith. It's like renouncing your, your marriage or renouncing your family. Falling away, falling away, but there's also renouncing of your faith. So we read in Scripture that there's a falling away. The definition of that is there's a renouncing of faith that's taking place. And so that just creates all kinds of confusion, does it not? I mean, can I lose my salvation? You know, can I mess that up? And and, I, and there's no doubt about it. When you start reading the Scriptures about this, ooh, you better get ready. It has, it's a very similar path that I've gone on over the years about the sovereignty of God and, and all that's associated with that. I, I, I studied that, I struggled with that, I agonized over it for 13 years. Well, this is one of those similar subjects, and it's the, it gets wrapped up into just one statement. Can you lose your faith? Are you always saved? Can you have salvation and then lose it? So that's what it always comes from. Uh, and everybody wants to know the answer to that. So Daryl, tell us today the answer to that question, can we lose our salvation? So without me stepping out and really going on the land, I think it'd be kind of good if we we went into Scripture and took a look at it, all right? I mean, it, I don't want to take too long with my jibber-jabber. I'd rather spend a little bit more time today digging into the Scripture so that we can start getting a flavor of tone and understanding on this subject. And I think the best way for us to foundationally lead into the scripture this morning is, is dealing with, the, with Israel once again. I mean, why do they have this Old Testament? You take the Bible and you got the Old Testament and you got the New Testament. Old Testament, New Testament. Why is so much of the Bible following the livelihood of this nation called Israel? So much of the Old Testament is just wrapped up in them and what's going on and how they play out over a long period of time. And you go, well, why do we need to know all of that about Israel when we got the New Testament that's so relevant to us? Why do we go back and have to study it? Well, it, because it answers a lot of these questions for us. Israel went through so much and had so many issues that just about everything they went through, when you look at it, we're going to go through similar here. We're going to have questions about things here that shows up with Israel and passes through Israel so we can get an understanding. That's how we get to know God better, and that's how we learn the answers to a lot of his questions. And the Holy Spirit guides you when you deal with Israel. So let me paint the picture. Israel, with Joseph, goes into Egypt. 
because of, remember we studied sanctification, because of the sanctification of Joseph? Remember we talked about that? One guy sanctifying the nation. And as a result of that sanctification, Israel, along with Egypt, came together under this protection of Joseph and his sanctification over both places. Pretty amazing. How do you bring Israel and Egypt together? I don't know. Only God can do those kinds of things. And it's under the sanctification power of Joseph that he brings them together. And, they're, and now they're together and Joseph is, is just sanctifying over them, doing what Joseph does all his life. But you know, Joseph dies. What happens when, you know, eventually people die. Or, like Moses, they do something really crazy and God says, no, you're not going to do that. I mean, think about it. All that time where Israel was under the sanctifying power of Moses. You know, they were under Joseph, lost Joseph. Then they went into bondage. And now comes Moses. And, and then the sanctifying power of Moses start take, starts taking over. And Israel witnessed the divine power of God come upon Israel and doing all these miracles. And Israel just got to see all that unfold. They're just... And they, you know, you should think of it. They had to be absolutely amazed at what God was doing for them. And he leads them out with Moses. And under this sanctifying power of Moses, they were protected. You know, Egypt came after them, but they couldn't catch up. They, they ran into the Red Sea. They ran into some water. You know, couldn't catch them. God was protecting them. Sanctifying power. But Moses, Moses had a problem. And what happened to the sanctifying power of God when that happened? Now Israel, understand, Israel had been enlightened by the sanctification of Moses, one, two, the divine power of God Almighty with all these miracles. I mean, unbelievable miracles taking place all over the place. Israel witnessed that, but yet, but yet they did not trust God. Even seeing, even being enlightened to that level with Moses and with all the miracles, you, you couldn't do more for anyone. It's impossible to do more. And yet they would not trust Him. That's important for you to remember. And important for you to store away as we start digging into Scripture because these are people that were once enlightened. They got exposed to God in every way imaginable. But yet they had to be wiped out completely before they could enter the promised land. That generation had to be wiped out completely. So you begin to understand how does God feel about those that have enjoyed all of the sanctif sanctification and been enlightened to all of his miracles, but yet they turn on him and did not trust him? How does he feel about that? His judgment will come. And he completely wiped out the entire nation. Understand that, root that, as we start digging into this subject. Can you lose your salvation? Can you fall away from God. Now, Kayla's in college right now. Madeline's going to be going in a couple, two years. Oh my goodness, two years. She's going to college. Maybe. Have you said that? <laughs> and you know, it used to be 60% of youth, young people that went to college fell away from their faith. Now it's at 75%. Okay, so it's worsening. Just like everything else is worsening. It's leading up to something, and that's why we want to explore Scripture. It's starting to lead up to something, and the part of leading up that we're going to explore is this. We're moving closer to the end time. As we move closer to the end time, 
people will begin to fall away. It was kind of like when Jesus was with the disciples and he was giving them a real hard talk. He's saying, you know, eat my body and drink my blood. And then he looked up and they were gone. You know, most of the disciples were gone except for the 12. You know, where are we going to go? We'd probably go too. If we knew where we could go. It's when things get really hard and confusing and difficult, many, many will fall away. And as we get closer and closer to the end time, it gets worse and worse. So college is something funny about college, you know? You, you all of a sudden, you're, not, you're no longer under that umbrella of, of your family, and you're thrown out there. And I think back to when I went to college, and I go, how in the world did I get through that? Um, how did I make it through college and still retain my faith? You know, because we all, in college, you, you definitely have your moments. But I came out of college, not only did I retain my faith, but I, I grew in my faith while I was in college. It was a strange thing. And then when I came out of college, you know, I was, I was in the BSU, and uh, that's, I think it was called the Baptist Studio. Is that an answer? The Baptist Union. I was in the BSU, very helpful. But the first time I went, the BSU was the Black Student Union. I was in the wrong place. And then, you know, I go, okay, I'm all, I'm all right with this, but it was not the BSU I thought it was. And so finally, I get to the right BSU, and we are playing sports, you know, against all these other different fraternities and different organizations. And then there's BSU. And so here we go, we're going out there, we're supposed to play sports, you know, and it's just a known fact that a lot of the Christian community are not really good at sports. It's just a known fact. And so there we were, we're supposed to be playing sports, it's, it's supposed to be competing. And, and we felt like it hardly good, given the circumstances where we were, that we'd go out on the field and have a little prayer. <laughs> and you can imagine the impression it makes on all the people there in this little group going out on the field. We kneel down, we have a piece of prayer time together. They go, oh, this is going to be good. I can imagine how great they're going to be. And so we get out there and we compete. And you know what? We won the championship in football that year. And it was so enlightening to me just to live out your faith in those circumstances. Living out your faith in college is tough. It's a very difficult thing to do. That's why 75% fall away when they go to college. They renounce their faith. And they go off on other things, other liberal and all kinds of things they get into. But that's a very disturbing understanding, a very disturbing statistic when you think about that. Well, as we get closer and closer to the end times as we're about to read the scripture, people start falling away. You know, it's kind of like this. You start off in an era, we're in a time right now, here in our country, we're in a time that we would call the time of temptation. And you know, that's what we're dealing with right now. Is as far as us falling away and has destroyed many a family, it's temptation. And so we're in the era of temptation. There's a, a Satan's tool, there's a lot of temptation in order to trigger a fall away, to get, to get you to fall away. So temptation starts kick, kicking in. Testing is a big deal. Uh, an example of testing would be Job. Okay. At some point along the way, you're going to be tested. Like going to college, you're going to be tested. And your faith is going to survive or it's not. And in many cases, faith does not survive temptation. Faith does not survive testing. Uh, faith does not survive trials of many kinds. You're going to go through these trials and you're going to, you're going to see if you come out the other side with your faith. You know, there's a reason why people come in here to church and then you don't see them again. Or well, they leave. They walk away from the faith. There's a reason for that. They're tested. Somewhere they're tempted. They're tested, they're put through a trial, and their faith doesn't survive. It gets eaten up, gets destroyed. Interesting fact there. When you look at that, 
and you start asking the question, can you lose it? Did you, did you have faith? And then you lost it because of a, a trial, because of a testing, because of a temptation. You lost your faith because of that. Well, you know, isn't that amazing? Was your faith so weak that the, the, the thing that comes along just dry, and then it, it gets to the end of time, so you got tribulation. That's a big one. I mean, think, think about that time that, that you read about in Scripture, Revelation, where you, there's a mark of the beast, and, and you've got to take on that mark of the beast. And, and if you don't take on that mark of the beast, you're going to be killed, or you're going to be wiped out economically. Just because you didn't take on the mark of the beast, your faith is going to be tested to the max at that time. And you can call it whatever you want, but it's the great purge. It's the great purge. It's purging out all of this that's not really faith. It's not really followers of God. And what history teaches us is that throughout history, it's a, just a huge group of people that claim to be followers, and they're not. And until they go through a temptation, a test, a trial, a tribulation, you really don't know. As long as things are very comfortable, and they're living their lives like they always do, and do what they do, and do the kind of things I enjoy doing, my faith is good. But you go through something, you go to college and you get into that temptation arena, watch what happens to faith that is not real. Or you get into a trial, you go through something really hard, and watch what happens when your faith is not real. Or if you get all the way in scripture to the end time, where they say you've got to take on the mark of the beast, you've got to worship this beast, You've got to give him your absolute allegiance. And if you do that, you will be well taken care of. And those that follow Christ either say, no, I'm not going to do it. Or they must renounce their faith. And there's a falling away. A great falling away in the end times. Because for once, you're finally seeing which faith is real for people and which is not. And right now, as we speak, I have no clue about any of you. I don't know. And isn't, that, isn't that interesting? But let me tell you, you get into those kinds of times that are coming, you're going to know. <laughs> you're going to know because there's so much falling away and it teaches us clearly that in those times, Christians are minorities. They're minorities. But you know what? They're minorities right now. We just don't have the great tribulation going on right now that is testing and trials going on right now to purge and weed out all the pretension, to purge and weed out that which is not real. We're not in an environment for that right now. You can praise God we're not in that environment. But let me tell you, it's that environment that purges out pretentious faith. When it's not real. It's all been a show. It's all been, and you're kind of wondering, just think to yourself, how much do I really read the Bible? <laughs> how much do I really care about reading the Bible? How much do I really care about praying? You know, do I really even care much about praying? Because one thing you're going to discover, if it's not real, you really don't care. The only time you care is when you get around other people and you've got to put on a show. You've got to pretend. And I don't know. That's not my job. I don't have to figure that out. But let me tell you, there's coming a time as we get towards end times, there's going to come a time when it will be tested and it's going to burn up or it's going to be real. And it's a minority. That's why you, you read the gate is narrow, only a few shall pass through. It's talking about the end times. During those times, there's so much turmoil against Christianity. There's so much persecution against Christianity that only a few are going to make it through that gate. Well, let me tell you, if you do that exact same thing today in our world, you'd have the same result. Only a few will make it through because if you test it to that level, most 
will fall away. I remember Neil Bortz on WSB, WSB Radio. Y'all remember Neil, Neil Bortz? You would not. But on WSB Radio, he would always come on and say, if you put a man in the right place under the right circumstances, he will always fail. And he, he used to say it all the time, radio, and he used to bother the hand out of me when he would make this stereotypical statement that if you put a man with the right temptation, he will always fail. Now you take Joseph, and you put, and Joseph got put in that situation. He got put in a situation that Neil Bortz would say, no man can get through that one. Joseph did. And it confirmed his faith. And the sanctification of Joseph from that point forward was mighty. You see, you're going to be under temptation and your faith will be tested. You're going to go to college and your faith will be tested. You're going to have a trial and your faith is going to be tested. And there's right now in the world, there are places in the world and we just don't realize it fully because when I was over in India, it was going on in India, they're killing Christians, they're killing pastors over there. They're trying to teach and preach the gospel and they're killing them right and left. And you know who has the faith and who does not. And it's not me. It's not me. Over here, oh, 80%, it's, it's cited that 80% of the people over here have a faith in God. You put them in that environment and the result will be the same. So, with that, let's go to Scripture. Let me take you on the journey as we deal with this subject. Can you fall away from your salvation? The first one I want to read is from 1 Timothy 4. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, it says, The Spirit clearly says in the latter times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences, remember we talked about consciences in here, whose consciences have been seared as with an iron, as with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry and order them to, to abstain from certain foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. you got to watch these folks. As we get closer and closer to the end times, they're fakes, they're frauds, they're pretentious, but they don't have anything to do with faith. And they're trying to create all these rules, just like the Pharisees did, the Pharisaical rules, where they took those wonderful laws that Moses took off the mountain, and they just started adding to them, and coming up with all kinds of other things that you're supposed to do, how you're supposed to do it, when you're supposed to do it, and people just eat it up, gullibly follow that, well, that's getting towards the end times. And folks, that's going on rapidly as we talk. Let's go to the next. In Hebrews 6, 4 through 6, watch this closely. Remember the story of Israel. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, <coughs> who have tasted the heavenly gift. Think about Israel. Who have shared in the Holy Spirit and watched it. Who have tasted the goodness of the Word of God and the powers of the coming age. And who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. What did that entire generation of Israel have to do? They had to die. There, was there any bringing back to repentance for them? Did they have an opportunity to repent, come back to God? That generation, no. Every one of them had to die before they would be in a position for Israel to go to the promised land. So when you've experienced all that, and when you've seen all that, you've seen God at work, you've been exposed to all that, and you refuse to accept Him, you refuse to follow Him, you're just playing a game with Him, folks, there is no repentance for that. It just doesn't work that way. God is certain about that. You can't play games, folks. Everything we're talking about today, when we talk about falling away, is serious. 
It's dangerous. It's incredibly serious. And it's incredibly dangerous. So that's why we look at these passages. Get our arms around it. It says, to their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. Moving on. Hebrews 3, 12 through 19. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the very end. As it has been said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not those who sinned, whose bodies perished in the wilderness? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. <laughs> Just gives us that clarity. That the, you can be exposed to so many beautiful, wonderful things under the sanctification of somebody else. You can be exposed to the miracles of God and the carings coming because of the sanctification of, of a person in your family, a sanctification of a person in a company, a sanctification of a person in a church, and you've been under that, and you've been exposed to that, and you've been able to live in that, that little bubble of sanctification for such a long time, and then discover that there's an unbelief because the first hiccup that occurs, you are gone. You cannot persevere. You cannot run the race. You cannot hold the course. First thing that happens, we look up and you're gone. What's up? Why? Why is that? Why is that? Because you never know who people really are until they're under temptation, testing, trial, and tribulation. We found out who Job was, did we not? Most anybody else in that situation would have wound up renouncing their faith. But Job's faith was real. It was real. Folks, time's going to come where you are going to be tested. Now, it teaches us in the Word, you're either tested here with temptation, testing, trials, and tribulation here, or it says you're put under fire in heaven. And anything that was done out of your efforts and done and pretentious and wasn't real gets burned up and what's left. And in many cases, when I say many, that's what scripture's going to teach. In many cases, there's nothing left. I never knew you. Away from me, evil doer. But I went to church. I, was, I saw it all. I was a part of those services where the Spirit came in and just moved mightily in the service. It was an amazing thing to see and behold and be a part of. It was just absolutely amazing. Yes, you can experience the goodness of God Himself and see it and be exposed to it. And He will say, I never knew you. A falling away occurs if the faith was never there to begin with. And Scripture is trying to teach us that it is rampant the number of people that pretend and think and say they have faith. And they do not. Many. Let's move on. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. You put somebody in a corner. I mean, just do that. Back somebody up in a corner and, and put on the pressure. And what will happen? 
Just watch what will happen. Many will turn away, betray each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most. Do you see the term? The love of most will grow cold. Their love was pretentious. Their, their love was not real. They really could care less about you or anybody else. Their love is for one person and one person only. And everything that exists on this planet is for that one person themselves. And you can pretend all you want, but let me tell you, the scripture is teaching us that there's going to come a time where you will fall away. Just like that. And you won't care. Because it's unbelief. You never believed to begin with. So you won't care. In fact, if we're going to read just a moment, let's move to the next. But I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. The one, you get the flavor. Second Peter 2. If they have escaped the corruption of the world by knowing our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and are again entangled in it and are overcome, they are worse off at the end than they were at the beginning. It would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have known it and then turn their backs on the sacred command that was passed on to them. Of them the proverbs are true. A dog returns to its vomit and a sow that is washed returns to her watering in the mud. It's worse for you to know about this than to be totally absent from it. It's teaching us that there are so many that are wrapped up in this umbrella of church, particularly in this country, we're wrapped up in an umbrella of church, and everybody's okay, and everybody's going to go to heaven, and everybody has faith, and everything is good. The scripture teaches us that as we're getting closer and closer to end times, he starts, Jesus starts ramping up the purging out of that. He starts purging it out by temptation, test, and trial, and tribulation. It starts purging, and the truth starts surfacing. You start learning, and you start knowing, and you start understanding who really has faith and who does not. And many, most, will turn away. They will fall away. Just like that. Just like that. Moving on. Hard subject, folks. Very hard subject. Romans 11, 19 through 22. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Granted. But they were broken off because of unbelief. And you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but tremble. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Consider therefore the kindness and sternness of God. Sternness to those who fail, but kindness to you, provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. This arrogance thing, folks, there are so many, and I have to, I have to get up and test myself in this area. There are so many that are arrogant about their faith. Oh, I know I'm going to go to heaven. I, I know I'm going to go to heaven. Now, that, now this guy over here, I don't know about, I don't know about so and so when they're going to go to heaven or not. I don't know. I'm not sure about them. I'm a little concerned about them, folks. It's an arrogance, and they can tell you one of the sure, powerful red flags of your faith is when you're arrogant about it. Think about the Pharisees. When you're arrogant about it and approaching it from a total lack of humility, there's a very, very strong chance, it's very strong evidence, you don't have it. Scary place to be. Read this, the word, root it into your heart and understand it. Moving on to the next. It says Revelation 3, 11 through 13, I am coming soon. Okay, hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven. And I will also write on them a new name, 
Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Folks, it's a beautiful thing when you withstand all of it, when you withstand the temptations, the tests, and the trials, and the tribulation. You come out, your faith is not only intact, it's growing, it's stronger. Folks, just understand, who plants the seed of faith in every person? It's God. He decides, he calls, he draws, he's got his children, and he plants the seed, plants the seed in them. And it says in Scripture that once they have that seed planted, they hear the gospel from somewhere. And that's like sunshine and water being poured upon that seed. When they hear the gospel on that seed that's been planted by God, it bursts forth with life. It comes up. Now you have a plant. And that's a beautiful thing to see. The seed was planted by God. He gave the water. He gave the sunshine. Up comes the plant, life, and the plant. Then comes along the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit starts pruning the leaves and starts growing the fruit. Pruning, growing. Pruning, growing. The Spirit takes on the role of sanctification, growing this plant into becoming incredibly fruitful. And that is real faith. It plants by God, it's sanctified by God, and what you do is keep your conscience clear, accept, trust, and be ready. Because he's moving and he's working in your life. And you're ready for that. That's real, true faith. That's exactly how it works in the Word. And what we're about to read is the one we've already read many times, the parable of the, of the soils. You got four different soils. You got pretentious. Three of them are fake. Three of those are fake. Three out of four. Let me just tell you this. This three out of four thing, three out of four people today do not believe that the Bible is inerrant. Three out of four today. Did not used to be anywhere close to that. Seven out of ten, seventy percent, seven out of ten don't believe in the deity of Jesus Christ. You take the deity of Jesus Christ out of the picture and you've lost all of Christianity. You're back to just like every other religion in the world. You take the deity, seven out of 10 Christians do not believe in the deity of Christ. Three out of four, three out of four do not believe that the word is truth. That is without error. Folks, this is where it's going. This is where it's going. They are falling away right and left. I just read statistically, I gave it to you, 6,000 churches are failing every year. We should be bringing on 10,000 churches every year to keep up with the population. It's just not happening. It's going the other direction, folks. It's being purged. The church, as we sit here today, is being purged. Purged, and people are falling away and they're renouncing their faith. I can just tell you right now, I've got, I've got a friend right now who's, who just had an incredible conversation with his best friend because his best friend renounced his faith. And he goes, oh my God, are you kidding me? And he sat down and he opened his heart and shared his heart with him. And it was like his best friend just completely got cold. He closed up. His, he renounced his faith. And you begin to realize that all of these years that they were together, best friends, growing up together, a part of each other's lives, all those years, it was all fake for all of those years. And he never knew it. It's amazing. It's happening all over. The purge is taking place right before our eyes. Is your faith real or is it not? Let's move on. We're going to wrap it up. Hebrews 10, 26 and 31. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of truth, no sacrifice for sin is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think someone deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified them 
and who has insulted the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, and again the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Folks, the worst thing you can do, this doesn't get any worse, is to pretend in faith. To live a life that's not real. It doesn't get any worse, folks. You're falling right into the hands of the living God. And you've been exposed to so much. You've been exposed to His Word, to His miraculous things that He's done. You've been exposed to the Spirit, the divine power of the Spirit going on all around you in the lives of people. You've seen all that. You've witnessed all of that. Yet, when the first storm, when the first hurricane wind hits, you will renounce your faith because it's not real. Moving on. Matthew 24. Jesus left the temple and was walking away with the disciples. Do you see all these things he asked? Truly I tell you, not one stone will be left on another, not one will be thrown down. As Jesus is sitting on the Mount of Olives. The disciples came to him privately tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be a sign of the coming? Jesus answered, watch that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah and will deceive many. You will hear of wars, rumors of wars. You will see that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but, it, but in the end, it's still to come. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of the birth pains. Then you will be handed over to, and you will be persecuted and put to death. And you will be hated by all nations because of me. That's, a, that's in this tribulation trials time. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. If you don't understand it, since there is a ramping up of one another, it's ramping up. And every little tick, as Jesus starts purging, every little tick of ramping up causes more falling away, causes more purge. Until at some point in time you go, what's the that? And when you get to the end time out there, it is just that. What's left? It's just a few. Only a few shall pass through the gate. And get all the fruit and the blessings that God gives them. It's just a great picture. Okay, I'm going to move on. I'm going to wrap it up. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. That's the arrogance. That's the arrogance. Moving on. 2 Peter. Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of lawless and fall from the secure position. Second Thessalonians, it says, For one day will come until the... This is not the beginning. Back it up one, please. Concerning the coming of Jesus Christ and our gathering to Him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way. For the day will come until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called God or his worship, so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. Don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? And now you know what is holding him back so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. But the one who now holds it back will continue to do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed. Then the Lord Jesus will overthrow him with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the, by the splinter of his coming. The coming of the lawless one. He will use all sorts of disciplines. 
So these are the end times. I'm not going to finish the passage, but these are the end times. It gives us that picture that it's rapid up. It's leading towards. It's coming to that place. The question is, when Jesus plants the seed, God, God says, I've given this child to you. It is yours, Jesus. And God plants the seed of faith. Then he waters it. And then he brings on that enlightenment of the sun upon it. And then it sprouts. And then the Holy Spirit comes and it, and it purges. The Holy Spirit comes and it sanctifies and it grows this thing up into where its fruit is. And it says you'll know them by their fruit. You'll know it. You'll see it. It's when there's not a lot of evidence of fruit we should be concerned. When there's slothfulness we should be concerned. When there's a lack of care, we should be concerned. When we're just not seeing the attributes of Jesus Christ in our lives, we should be concerned. Because it's teaching us that many are now in the time of falling away. We're in the time of temptation. There's a lot of falling away. You know people all around you that are falling away because of it. There's times of testing right now. We're going to be tested. It's coming. If you're not tested now, you will be. Will you fall away? Or is it real? Trials and tribulation. Who knows when that's coming? This, I don't know about you, but I sense and, and feel it's coming fast. And there will be a lot of falling away. A lot of falling away. So folks, to bring this thing to a close, can you lose your salvation? The sovereign will of God that we focused on so much the last few weeks, the sovereign will of God draws and calls and elects and chooses. And if you, by any stretch of the imagination, think that anyone's going to be left behind, that God has called, drawn, and elected, you don't know God, as we talked about last week. He is sovereign. So no one that comes into a true faith that He has planted and He has grown and He has sanctified, no one will lose that. You cannot lose that. That's clear in His Word. God is sovereign. He drew you from the beginning. The problem is, the problem is when we pretend and we make it up. And that's why it says, you can fall into that trap. You can fall into the church trap, He says, where you pretend and make up your salvation and make up your faith. And you're trying to be like everybody else in there, and it's not real. That's a problem. You need to go to Him with that. If you are sensing at all that you're not feeling the fruit, you're not feeling the sanctification going on in your life, you're just kind of in a rut. It's all obligatory stuff going on. You're obligated to read, you're obligated to pray, you're obligated to go to church, but it's, but it's not real. It's not a hunger and thirst. A sanctification is taking place where we are becoming more like Christ. And we love Him. And we want to be more like Him. We want to know Him more. Where He knows us and we know Him. We're abiding in Him. He's abiding in us. That's what He's teaching us. To confirm your salvation. Test your salvation. Make sure it is real. Make sure it's real today. So I'm asking you to stand and we'll pray. We'll sing our last song together. Let me pray for you today. I hope this is a, gives you a feel and an understanding of falling away and what's going on around us. It's going on all around us. So we need, we need to pray. Pray for people. Pray for everyone. So stand together. Father, thank you.